the ethical side is crucial, that we really think through the ethics. And your point is very important because it has implications. I don't think Christians should run away from new technology any more than they should run away from trains and motor cars, as some tried to do because they were off the devil. Go back to my analogy of the knife. A knife can be used for surgery or for murder. We need to make sure these new knives, which are very sophisticated, are used for surgery and not for murder. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. And I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel. That way you'll never miss a thing. So pastors, I know how difficult it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, especially when you're preaching week after week. So whether you're hitting a writer's block or you're in a rush because it's Friday and you're trying to put the finishing touches on your sermon, things don't always go as planned. So to help you, I've created a 10-step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I've simplified the whole process of preparation into a series of steps and reminders that can help me and you ensure that our sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So just go to preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description. You'll get a copy sent to you for free today. Today's episode is also brought to you by Compassion. Words are powerful, but as a communicator, it's far too easy to underestimate the impact of experiences. So when people experience God in a way that is outside their usual rhythms and routines, lives change. That's why I encourage you to bring a compassion experience to your church. It's an interactive way to witness the realities of life for children in poverty and the church's incredible response. Families in your community will see how the gospel is transforming lives around the world. And because not everybody can go on a mission trip, you can bring the experience to you. Compassion is currently working with the local church to release over 2.2 million children from poverty in Jesus' name. And I have personally supported them for years. To learn more, go to compassion.com slash carry. And now to today's episode. Well, Professor John Lennox, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. We have Toronto in common, which is which is wonderful, right? So uh, you spent some time in Toronto back in the '60s, and and just as we get started, I really want to drill down on AI. AI. But is it true that you took some lectures with C.S. Lewis toward the end of his life at Cambridge? It is. I listened to the very last lectures C.S. Lewis gave in Cambridge in that year, 1962, same year as I went to Toronto for three months. And no. I listened to, th- I think, three or four lectures on John Donne, which were the last lectures he ever gave. Did people have any sense that he was C.S. Lewis in the way we would revere C.S. Lewis today? Or was it just he was a really good professor that wrote a few books? Oh, I think they had a sense of that. The place was absolutely packed yeah. and there was a, hardly any space Uh, for him to come in and lecture. It was pretty clear he was a legend in his own time. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, maybe that will be uh, for another day, but I just just had to raise that because I don't really know a lot of people who knew C.S. Lewis, so that was fantastic. You have a... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. For your interest, I have reenacted C.S. Lewis lecturing in my film Against the Tide with Kevin Sorbo. Okay. (laughs) That is news to me. So tell it. Tell us more. It's a full-length documentary, and Kevin Sorbo is well known over there as Hercules and Andromeda. So, so okay. he came to Oxford to quiz me about my faith in God as a scientist and also my specific belief in Christianity. So it's filmed both in Oxford and Israel, and it's available. Ah. Well, we will find it and link to it in the show notes, and I will watch it with great delight. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to drill down on AI. We're doing a mini-series on the podcast on artificial intelligence, and we're recording this in the summer of 2023. And I mean, the, the quantum leaps in AI over the last few years, but particularly in the last year, have been um, astounding. But I want to start with some basics. Um 
How do you define artificial intelligence? Just so people can understand it from someone who studied the subject in depth. What is your definition of AI? Sure, it's very important to get some idea of what's going on. There are two kinds of artificial mm-hmm. intelligence called narrow and general. A narrow AI is a system that consists of a computer, a database, and an algorithm that sifts through that database. And it does one thing and one thing only that normally requires a human intelligence. But it's not real intelligence. That's why we call it artificial intelligence. It simulates. So take an example Mm -hmm. We have a database of a million x-rays of people's lungs labeled by top doctors with their diseases. And then an x-ray is taken of your lungs or mine, and the artificial intelligence system rapidly compares your x-ray with the million x-rays, and it comes up with a diagnosis. And these days, that will be better than you get at your local hospital. So that is narrow AI, and it's used in many areas very effectively. It drives your GPS, it drives your purchases on Amazon, it suggests all kinds of things that you ought to buy, etc., etc. Now, artificial general intelligence is very different. As the name implies, the idea here is to make some kind of AI that can do everything that human intelligence can do and do it faster and better. So we're getting there into the realm of creating super intelligence. And there are two ways people are trying to reach out to that goal. And the one is to enhance existing humans and to possibly, some suggest, merge them with technology eventually, or to start and try to be independent of biological material. So start with silicon or something else and create some kind of simulated intelligence from scratch. Now, of course, AGI, we're nowhere near that yet, if ever we get there, and there are Hmm. huge difficulties in the way, but it's the stuff of science fiction. But there are serious people who feel that we'll at least get partway to it, if not the whole way. So there are those two parts. But the stuff that is concerning us at the moment is artificial narrow intelligence. So we're worried about the small problem, but there's potentially a big one coming down the pipe. Um, Do you believe, because there's been some debate, at least where we are when we're recording this interview, that even ChatGPT4 is showing signs of sentience and that that means, you know, cognition in and of itself. It's not just the algorithm. It's sort of going beyond what it was coded to do. Is there any evidence that any artificial narrow intelligence is showing signs of sentience at this point? None whatsoever. And I... Ah, So you would would not agree with those reports? uh, Not at all, because first of all, we don't know what sentience is. Nobody knows what consciousness is. Secondly, the experts in the field, and one of them has come out recently to say that AI is no more sentient than your toaster, (laughs) which is a very (laughs) metaphor. This is computation. It's very advanced computation. It's got a vast uh, database, but the system doesn't know what it's doing. It's simply churning out a response uh, because there are very sophisticated algorithms working there. But none of the leading players, so far as I know, think it's remotely like consciousness. In fact, I find most people, like Peter Norvig, who's one of the big names in this and has written the Computer Bible, and others like him, agree with Alan Turing, who is the original genius behind a lot of this, saying... We are in the simulation game. We have no idea of creating a conscience or a conscious or sentient being. All we want to do is create advanced simulation as near to human as possible in what it does, not in what it is. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, that, I'm glad you weighed in on that. Um, where do you see AI going in the next couple of years, in two to three years, 
Because I think one of the things that's dominating the headlines is people are concerned that it's advancing so rapidly. Uh, we thought this would take 15, 20 years to get to perhaps a point of singularity, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But in the next two to three years, by 2025, what are what are some imminent breakthroughs you see as possible in AI? Well, I'm 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 not a prophet. And one yeah. can say clearly that chat GPT-4 is going to give way to chat GPT-5, uh, and there are going to be great advances. Some of the recent advances have been massively impressive, such as the solution of the folding problem for proteins and the very advanced image recognition technology that is being used in medicine. Uh, and I presume that the, those will go on and on and be more and more impressive. Unfortunately, AI, I look at it like any tool. Let's take a knife. A very sharp knife can be used for surgery, but it can also be used for murder. And the problem is that mm -hmm. the ethical underpinnings are lagging way behind the development. And unfortunately, the very same technology that's been used for great advantage for, let me take that image recognition system, a police force can use it to pick out a criminal in a football crowd, and that's very good. But it can also be used to suppress an ethnic minority. And so we have this big danger of the kind of prophecy that was made in the dystopian novels of Huxley and Orwell, uh, that Big Brother is watching you in a very big way. And that can lead to a very oppressive invasion of privacy and also to autocratic control. So there are pretty scary things on the horizon. And how far we'll go down that road, I just don't know. It certainly is being developed in some countries. Well, you open your book or through your book, 2084, you do talk about Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, George Orwell's 1984. And you also quote Neil Postman, who I thought handled that just brilliantly in the introduction to amusing ourselves to death all those years ago. I'd love for you to frame the scenario that Huxley and Orwell imagined. And then I would love for you to weigh in on what dystopian world you think we are most likely to enter into, uh, Huxley's, Orwell's, or another option? Well, Orwell was the man with Big Brother, and he warned mm -hmm. that uh, we would eventually be imprisoned by an externally imposed oppression. But in Huxley's vision, you didn't need a Big Brother. Uh, he uh, as he saw it, people would come to love their oppression and to adore the technologies that actually undo their capacity to think. And it seems to me that in the culture today, both things are happening simultaneously. We love our technology. Mm -hmm. We are wedded to our smartphones that are tracking us and maybe listening to us and harvesting a vast amount of information about us that without our permission, incidentally, is being sold on to third parties. But we still mm -hmm. do it. We love it. And yet, that very same technology can be used uh, to oppress us and enslave us. And you say, what do I see developing? Well, to go straight to the heart of it, it seems to me that one scenario that people have rather set aside uh, for many years is the biblical one. People are scared mm. of taking the book of Revelation seriously because it's full of symbolism. But when Paul wrote his second letter to the church at Thessalonica, and I'm speaking as a Christian now, but I always say to people, mm -hmm. don't reject Christianity before you listen to what it says. And what it has to say on this score is very interesting because Paul observes the Roman culture at the time, and he sees in it a danger. There's an ideology that's beginning to work that he says, watch it because it's going to reap a harvest. And that was the imperial cult, the worship of the Caesars, their deification. And we come right into the 21st century and we listen to someone like Yuval Noah Harari with his homo deus and saying, look, we've raised humanity from beasts, now we must turn them into gods. And this man is God idea, the deification of humans. 
is a central theme of the Bible from essentially the first couple of pages. You shall be as gods if you eat the forbidden fruit. Now, Paul in the first century says, look, this trend towards deifying some humans is going to get worse and worse until eventually there will be a world leader who will oppress massively because he's being empowered by God's prime enemy, the devil himself, and will deceive the nations and will actually sit in the temple and declare himself to be God. And that individual, according to Paul, will be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's return. Now, that mm -hmm. prospect, it seems to me we need to take very seriously because the way in which is unpacked in the book of Revelation is uncannily close to what leading physicists, for example, Max Tegmark in his book Life 3.0, he imagines what he calls the Omega Corporation that swallows up the entire world, has got a powerful leader, but the control of the economy is done by forcing everybody to wear what he calls a bracelet that is the power to inject you with a lethal toxin if you don't obey the party line. Now, you can't buy or sell without this bracelet. The book of Revelation talks about a leader under the symbolism of a wild animal, which is very apt because governments and leaders can behave like wild animals, who will control the economy by having everybody uh, have a mark on their hand or their forehead. It's exactly the same idea. And my argument carries very simple. If we are prepared to take seriously, as people do, that kind of Omega Corporation scenario, then I would like to ask people to take seriously a scenario that actually has more credibility, for reasons that I can explain, but started 20 centuries ago, and it's in the Bible. And I would like to see Christians not so afraid and pastors not so afraid of going into the book of Revelation granted that they do it carefully and wisely and don't join the lunatic fringe because that only discredits it in the eyes of everybody. Well, I, there's so much to break down there, John. <laughs> and I mean, part of it is what you just named at the end. Unfortunately, you know, books like Revelation and parts of Daniel have been, and, and Second Thessalonians have been uh, the, the 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 almost sole province of the lunatic fringe, yes, where you've got right. people who, I remember as a child, you know, Brezhnev, the Soviet leader, was the bear from the north, and then it was someone else, and then it was Elton John was the Antichrist. And I heard all kinds of theories. And, you know, even as a 10-year-old, I'm like, eh, I don't think that's true. Um, and yet, you take almost, uh, I don't know how well you know N.T. Wright, but reading 2084, you take a, a scholarly approach to the book of Revelation. And so you're saying, don't dismiss it because there are parallels between what we see in scripture, what is predicted, and the technology that we're seeing now. Do you worry that that can be seen as alarmist in some circles, or do you think we just need to take that a lot more seriously? I certainly am concerned that it can be seen as alarmist because nothing turns people off more rapidly but what I want to plead for is realism. And the book of Revelation mm -hmm. is written, and it tells us so, by someone who loves us and loosed us from our sins. Mm -hmm. And it's important to take the book as balanced. And the fascinating thing about it is that in this book, with these many grim scenes of judgment, it's absolutely full of yeah. singing, which raises a... Mm. A very interesting question. And because I feel this message that starts in the Old Testament, as you suggested in Daniel, is important, I started my work on this, and it's not the only field I work in by far, by writing a book on Daniel called Against the Flow, in order to show that the issues that are raised in the 6th century BC in what I call King's College da 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 Babylon, for Daniel and his friends, are almost identical to the issues raised uh, today. And what I plead for is getting behind the symbols to see that they stand for realities. 
Uh, I learned from C.S. Lewis, whom you mentioned earlier, the sheer importance of realizing that metaphors and symbols are used to describe realities that often are not uh, comprehensible or apprehended by our six senses, but they do stand for realities. When Jesus said, I am the door, he didn't mean us to assume he was made of plastic or wood or steel. But he's not a literal door, but he's a real door. He's a real doorway into a genuine experience of God. And likewise, the symbols in Revelation of these animals, they clearly, as in Daniel, we are told that they represent kingdoms and leaders and so on. And that makes perfect sense. So I see a way into this, and I've tried to put it into my book, 2084. And I've been very encouraged by the response to that, not only from Christian believers, but from the secular world who are fascinated uh, to hear that there actually is a scenario that's much older than some of the contemporary ones. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, and you do have the biblical hermeneutic of multiple fulfillment. Uh, You know, for example, when Daniel was written, uh, there had been superpowers before Daniel, superpowers in Daniel's lifetime, Babylon, um, you know, you get into the Persian Empire, then you move into the Roman Empire. And, you know, there's a certain sense, I'm sure, in the Second World War, people looked and thought, oh, it must be the evil empire of Nazism that is the ultimate power. But it's a way, you know, that that biblical hermeneutic of multiple fulfillment. I did the fool's errand of doing a 22-week study of the book of Revelation a number of years ago in my ministry. So I'm pretty familiar with the different schools of thought on metaphor and imagery and apocalyptic literature in the first century. And yet there is a message there. So I want to get into surveillance technology because I think, you know, the worst of Christianity is build a bunker, hide, have lots of ammunition, lots of water, uh, iodine pills, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Yet, you know, we're called to be in the world. And yet you talk about this in your book, the surveillance technology exists. It's being used probably, well, all over the world. I mean, you look at airports, it's all surveillance technology now. You're being filmed anywhere you are in public. But I have read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in places like North Korea or communist China, they can now, through surveillance technology, discern the motives on your face. And, you know, if you walk into a room and you don't salute the leader, um, perhaps you could be penalized for that. In the same way that a lot of insurance companies in America and beyond are now asking you to put a little tracking device in your car. Do you speed? Do you stop at stop signs? Do you do all of that? If you're a good citizen, your rates will go down. If you're a bad citizen, your rates will go up. Well, that that could be translated with current technology into do you support the state or not support the state? Do you see that? And what are the threats? Because I think you're right. The combination of technology and government is a really, and the constant surveillance economy is very interesting. I'd love your thoughts on that. Well, I can only go by the reports that are coming out of China. And the system that fits what you're describing is the social security system. Now, there are varying levels of support as to how far it is rolled out. But the basic idea is that you start with so many credit points and you can add to those credit points if you behave as a good citizen. In other words, if the cameras show you behaving well, you take your rubbish and you put it out in the right thing. You don't talk to uh, too many suspicious foreigners. Uh, You turn up at work on time. And even you have a smile when you go into the factory, it measures that and a lot of other emotions as well. And so your credit rating goes up and you start to find you've access into better travel facilities. You can go to better shops, you can travel and all this kind of stuff. Whereas if you go the other direction, you suddenly find your credit card cut off, you can't travel, and you may even lose your job. And There are sufficient reports around to make this highly credible, and I've tried to follow them. And one of the articles that came out a couple of years ago that I mentioned in my book made the very interesting comment at the end. It said, look, 
All this technology is available in the West. The only difference is it's not yet in the hands of a centralized government. But there are people in the West who would love to have this technology. And I suppose one of the issues at the heart of it is this. How much are you prepared to give up of your privacy in order to have guaranteed security? And even beyond that, how much are you prepared to allow your very thoughts to be controlled? Because that's what we're moving towards. Uh, various implementations of things that control your thoughts, your ideology, so that you tow the party line. Now, we're not quite there in the West, but we're facing a problem, not simply with the sophistication with the, of the surveillance technology, but the capacity now of advanced AI to create what are called deep fakes. A very short audio clip of me and video clip, then I can be made to say anything that the controllers wish. Mm -hmm. And that is going to lead to huge deception. And if I might just say, as an aside, one of the things that Jesus himself and his apostles and in the book of Revelation has strongly emphasized is that deception, massive deception, will increase. And the eventual world leader will be an absolute master of deception. So we shouldn't be surprised if on the track up to that time, we see, as you say, multiple fulfillments of this kind of thing. And therefore, what Paul was saying to the Thessalonians credible, he said, look at your society. This trend is already there. And we can look at the 21st century society and read Homo Deus, by Harari and say this trend is very much there because there are people now who believe that they are at least on the verge of turning human beings into gods by genetic engineering, drugs, and everything else. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. scripture is on track and that builds up as credibility, certainly in my mind. Yeah, and there's so many philosophical, theological themes under what we've talked about so far. And I imagine that the average heart rate of listeners at this point in the podcast has <laughs> spiked significantly uh, because you're not talking about future technology in China. You're talking about what many accounts would suggest is happening in real time. And again, there, as you said, there's probably people in the United States on the left and on the right who thinks, well, that would be great. Everybody ought to rule with the Supreme Court on this or agree with me on this. And those who That's don't right. should be published. I read a poll recently that said, uh, I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but maybe half of Americans think that America should split along ideological lines, that there be red states and blue states. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a really terrifying time uh, to be alive and yet God is sovereign. But underneath all of this, John, is agency. And the human's ability, and we can get into a long theological conversation about predestination versus three free will, but the conversation often in AI is, is human agency, right? Do you have the freedom if you don't want to go to work, but you've got a smile on that camera every day, or if you are a speeder, but now you've got to be in compliance, or uh, your social credit score is going down? Like that gets, you know, soon you can't practice your religion. Soon you have to salute the emperor or the president or whatever. It is that, that, that think that big brother mantra that, that George Orwell talked about. What are your thoughts about how humans retain agency in this kind of a world? Well, first of all, I, I think your comments are important. As for determinism and free will, I'm not going to comment on that mm -hmm. because I've written a massive book about it called Determined to Believe, question mark, where I go into what the Bible actually teaches. But I think central to all of this is the biblical doctrine that human beings have been created in the image of God. And I was watching Jordan Peterson not long ago give a lecture in Genesis, and when he came to that statement, he said, this is the cornerstone of our civilization. And then he hesitated and he said, man, we disregard this at our peril. And I think we do. The doctrine of 
humans created in the image of God is a cornerstone and it gives us immense dignity and value at the same time. And of course, at a higher level than that, the values that God showers upon us are immeasurable when it comes to the fact that Christ died for us. And that's a central message, not only of the entire scriptures, but of the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation reveals against the background of these beasts, so to speak, these animal brute force leaders on their thrones on earth, it reveals a heaven where there's a lamb upon the throne. And I think Mm. you were talking about people's heart rate rising listening to me. I think that what we need to do is get a renewed vision of who is ultimately in control. And that is the Lord Jesus as as the, the Lamb of God. And therefore, he has the right to judge. The world cannot take its creator, so to speak, and slay him, slaughter him like a lamb, and think they've heard the last of him. They haven't heard the last of him. And that's why the central Christian hope is that Christ will return. As the disciples were told as they watched him ascend, this same Jesus shall so come in the same way as you saw him go. So we need to communicate that hope very much indeed. And and therefore realize that the greatest gift that God has given us, every one of us, made in his image, is the capacity to say yes or no. We're not Mm -hmm. determined robots, even if they fill us full of mescaline and all kinds of things. And This is the criterion that in this world we choose to follow Christ. We make a deliberate choice to follow him. And he has promised to uphold us in our culture until our job is done. And I firmly believe that. But I can see that there's going to be a vast storm of difficulties to deal with because of these technologies, we haven't mentioned one of the biggest, and that is job loss. Uh, there's going mm. to be a huge number of jobs that are taken over by chat GPT-4 because it is so mm. impressive. I've seen the results myself at doing summaries, writing reports, sports reports, business reports, all this kind of thing. And a lot of people are going to either have to retrain or find a new job. And that sounds great. In countries like our own, where there is advanced education that can skill people to take on these new jobs. But I was in South Africa and they said, we're really bothered by this because we don't have the educational infrastructure to teach people uh, and to retool them, uh, so to speak, mentally so that they can do these jobs and reskill them. So there are huge problems, but there have always been huge problems. You know, our culture, Kerry, when the gospel came to Europe, somebody said the other day in a book I was reading that Europe was the first continent to be Christianized. It's the first one to be de-Christianized. In the UK here, now we have more than 50% who are not believers. And we are back to pagan Rome. But the gospel triumphed at the time of pagan Rome, where they were worshipping the emperors and they behaved like brute beasts. And so it is all, to my mind, asking us to trust Christ in these circumstances as the one who's overcome. What are are some things you are doing? Because the agency argument just isn't about the future. There have been people saying for years, and if you saw The Social Dilemma, that that documentary a few years ago, you you recognize it, that we've already surrendered our agencies, that we thought we were controlling our phones, but actually our phones are controlling us. And that ability, as you say, at the heart of agency is the ability to make a decision, to actually choose in our free will. You know, I'm not choosing the faith of my parents. I'm choosing to embrace Christ or I'm choosing to Mm -hmm. do X or I'm choosing to marry this person or to make this purchase or to make this job. That's right. And I think you're right. That is somehow very tied to the image of God in every human. How are you and how do you suggest we protect our agency when— There's so many threats to it right now. I think we have to work at it. I often say, 
when I'm speaking particularly to churches and church leaders, we need to learn to practice electronic fasting. In other words, to deliberately go without being glued to smartphones. I'm particularly concerned for the younger generation. Many of them, for them, disconnection is death. Uh, in the literal sense, they commit suicide when they're not liked on, on Facebook or something similar. They must be connected. And we need to try to distance ourselves from our image and our agency being taken away from us or, even worse, giving it up voluntarily. And that can happen by all kinds of addictions. They don't need to be narcotic addictions. They can be addictions to gaming. They can be, and mm -hmm. adults are, are caught by that kind of thing. And I don't know, there's no easy fix to this. It seems to me that the Christian faith is a dynamic thing. It's a cooperation with God and his Holy Spirit developing integrity of character and making moral choices that are right and swimming against the, the tide that attempts to engulf us. And we can't do it on our own. And I recall what Jesus said to his disciples in a pretty grim situation when he was about to go to the cross. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, we can do lots of things, but they're not effective. And therefore, our faith, our trust needs to be built up. And I would say that one of the huge failures of many areas of the Christian church is that pastors and leaders, and this is a wild generalization, it's not true everywhere, are not answering young people's questions. They're leaving them defenseless against this flood of stuff. And we need to see a generation grow up that really immerses itself in the only weapon that can deal with this enemy, and that is the Word of God. And I'm just thankful that when I was a teenager, someone poured understanding of the Word of God into my mind and started me going. And it's going to mean sacrifice of time and commitment. We're not going to deal with this by getting a sermon from the internet at 12 o'clock on a Saturday night after watching late night films. There has to be a radical change, it seems to me. And it has to start with me. And that's the problem. We see this as a huge difficulty, which it is. And because we feel we're only a drop in the ocean, we forget to start with ourselves. And I think God would call us to do that and give us significance, even if we're only helping one starfish at a time to get out of the, the way of the crabs. So, I mean, that poses a real dilemma. Uh, I love Kevin Kelly's book on the future, the title called The Inevitable, because there is an inevitability, like someone who says, okay, I'm not going to have any AI in my life. I'm not going to have any technology. Well, good luck. You can go live off the grid in the woods, et cetera. But then you don't really have a role in the world or a job in the world. That's right. And people who say, well, I'm not getting into that AI or surveillance economy. If you use Alexa, if you use Siri, if you use Google, you're already in it, right? Like there yeah. is an inevitability. Right. There's no purity to be able to, to pull away. So, I mean, what are some practices or guardrails you have for leaders? Because, I mean, I'm using chat GPT-4. Is that something I should stop? What, what is your recommendation? The ethical side is crucial, that we really think through the ethics. And your point is very important because it has implications. I don't think Christians should run away from new technology any more than they should run away from trains and motor cars, as some tried to do because right. they were off the devil. Go back to my analogy of the knife. A knife can be used for surgery or for murder. We need to make sure these new knives, which are very so sophisticated, are used for surgery and not for murder. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. one of the important things, and I encourage Christians who are scientifically gifted to go into this area, to make two kinds of contribution. One, to contribute to the technology, but also to contribute to the ethical underpinnings. And the reason that a moratorium has been called on chat GPT-4, not to go any further, 
whether that will be held to or not, I don't know. And there are many cynical people saying that actually what's happening there is these huge companies who've developed this and are still developing it now say, we've developed this and we will stop it harming you. Uh, so they gain a monopoly. <laughs> Very clever. Well, I'm not sure about <laughs> That's those. right. That's right. Here's but, the poison, but buy our pill to keep you from Yes, dying, yes, we'll right? solve yeah. it for you. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, I think of somebody like Rose Pickard, Professor Rose Pickard at MIT, and she has founded a whole subject area within AI herself. It's called affective AI. And what she has developed are bracelets, interestingly, smart watches that can sense if a child is going to have an epileptic fit or something like that, and therefore save its life. Now, she's a Christian, mm-hmm. And this is a highly credible thing for people to be involved in. Running away from the technology won't help. But being there and helping develop an ethic and showing the weaknesses in some of the ethical systems. I mean, here my I was for most of my life a mathematician, but I actually did a higher degree in bioethics to get into this kind of field, to understand what is going on. And it's not easy because no one wants to answer the question, who said so? Because we've lost our base for ethics. Now, Christians can contribute to that because as a Christian, I'm saying, look, if you simply develop ethics at a horizontal level, that is what I do to you and you do to me, that's okay. But if you lose the transcendent, a God above it all, then, of course, the person with the greatest power can do what they like. And if you say you oughtn't to do that, they'll say, well, why oughtn't I to do that? I've got the power, you haven't. And it's it's that clash that we see in business and everywhere else where there's an, un, an imbalance in power centers that the biggest brute gets away with it. But if there's a God watching us and we trust him, that's a very different matter. How can we, and that's my question, how can we credibly get this? Uh, There's a famous leading advocate in Britain, I've forgotten his name, and he's an atheist, but he said, you know, I think maybe the only cure for our society is to bring back the concept of a God who's watching us, because that will mean that people will be more careful what they do. And of course, that's an entirely biblical view. No, that's so helpful, you know, because I can see the immediate reaction to even a short conversation like this would be, we cue all the Luddites. Every generation has Luddites. Oh, yes. We're opposed to machinery. And and you know what? The Luddites were right, but it was inevitable. And there's an inevitability to this. And I think you make a very good point that if we all retreat into a corner, into our nuclear bomb shelters, um, the bad actors win. And all of a sudden, there's no theology guiding the ethics. We should be at the forefront of this helping to steer the conversation, not in the back seat going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Any? Do you see any bright lights or voices we should be paying attention to that are helping us navigate? Because you're right, the technology is moving ahead of the ethics and the theology. So are there any notable voices that we should all be looking at, following, listening to who are making a meaningful contribution to the ethics of AI and technology? I think there are some voices, but we have to, if we're Christians, uh, take seriously what they say and compare them with what we're observing. Uh, There are a number Mm -hmm. of very gifted Christian people. I think immediately of a friend of mine, Professor John Wyatt, who was a professor of neonatal surgery, and he's co-authored a book on artificial intelligence called The Robot Will See You Now, which is, of course, contextualized in medicine, but not only in medicine. Uh, Another colleague, a professor in Oxford, Brooks, Nigel Crook, has written a book called The Rise of the Moral Machines. Now, what interests me in the secular world, Kerry, is the emergence of a number of leading intellectuals who, although they're not Christians yet, and I say that advisedly, are 
fighting against the fundamental materialism and naturalistic philosophies that dominate particularly the academy. People who are saying, look, there must be something more. I, I think of people like um, uh, the author of this, this book, uh, Tom Holland, uh, of Dominion, this brilliant book yes. on first century history. And what he is saying into the culture is, look, I used to think as an ancient historian that all the good things in our value system, in our institutions, all came from Greece and Rome. And he starts to study and he begins to realize that actually all the good things come from the Judeo-Christian teaching of the Bible. And what fascinated me about his book, and I found immensely powerful, was he discovers that the heart of all of this was the revolutionary teaching by Paul of the cross. And he's bringing that to a public space in a way in which a pastor would find it very difficult to do. Here's an ancient historian who's a culture watcher who's telling us, in his own way, Jordan Peterson is raising all kinds of questions. And there are a number mm -hmm. of people like this mm -hmm. who are saying, look, there must be something more. Uh, and I find that very encouraging. On the other hand, there are voices that aren't so well known of younger people, Christians who are very highly educated and really going out into the youth culture. I work with some of them here in Oxford in the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, and they're making real waves because, of course, in the culture, many young people, they face all this stuff and they find they've got no meaning. Uh, the interesting thing is, and a very powerful book has been written by a psychiatrist recently, Ian McGilchrist, uh, it's called The Matter With Things. Uh, and he's raising the question, how is it we understand how most things work, but we do not understand the meaning of anything? And Jonathan Sachs, our late chief rabbi, he read this, uh, idea, which is a powerful idea. And he said, ah, I've got it. Science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts them together to see what they mean. And I think the key to what you're saying is that if we can inject meaning, transcendent meaning into the space around us, we will be helping the culture. If we don't have a credible source of meaning, we might as well be quiet. Well, I hope we get there. And uh, I can't believe we're at time already. This has been an absolutely delightful conversation. And I want to thank you for leaning into our audience today. Uh, really appreciate it, Dr. John Lennox. Thank you. If people want to track with you more, the book is called 2084. Simple title to find anywhere books are sold. And you've written many other books. But if people wanted to find you online, is there a website or anything that you would direct them to? Oh, yes. Uh, I have a website, johnlennox.org, and that will track you not only to the books, but to the film, which is available for streaming and on Blu-ray, DVD, and also to the debates that I've done with some of the leading atheists in the world. But thank you very much. I I've enjoyed this immensely, actually. It's lovely to meet you. And I admire greatly what you are doing for the culture, because this kind of thing, to my mind, is very worthwhile doing. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I just hope we don't all cower in a bunker and that we bring, you know, one of my favorite verses is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And as a young person, I thought, I think we parked our brains at the door, and I'd like to bring them back into the church. And uh, so I really appreciate it. It's people like you who help us do that. And uh, well, I really enjoyed your treatment. Well, let me say one last thing yeah. then. Keep going. I have Please written do. a little book, a very little book called Have No Fear. And it's precisely on this to encourage people to step out of their comfort zone and articulate their faith in Christ without being scared of being unable to answer questions and so on. And it comes from a lifetime mm. for trying with God's help to do this called Have No Fear, and you can find it online. That's fantastic. Well, Dr. Lennox, thank you so much. I hope this isn't our last conversation, and you've helped a lot of people today, including me. <laughs> <laughs>